I thought in light of the fact that it is uh, St. Patrick's Day this weekend, I'd start the sermon this morning with a limerick. And I was going to kind of do it with an Irish brogue, but I realized that that would kind of be Irigian, and we'd need probably a translator and things like that, so no Irish brogue. But here's the limerick. There once were two cats from Kilkenny. Each thought there was one cat too many. They fought and they spit, and they clawed and they bit, till instead of two cats, there weren't any. Now, that may strike you as funny because we can picture cats. If you've ever had more than one cat, you've probably heard cats going at each other, whether in the backyard or in the alley or out behind the barn. You know what I'm talking about. Cats are cats, and cats are like that. But Christians, believers, would we behave like that? Well, yeah, at times we do. There's a church in Ohio called the Bethlehem Church of Christ. Their church building was built back in 1840, around the time of the Civil War. And in their history book from that time, you can read this. We have fighting right here at home. The Democrats and the Republicans were so bitter against one another, it broke up the church. On the same page in the booklet, we are told of a fistfight that took place on the church property between two men. One wanted to know if the other had enough. He said he had, so he let him up. So we see some of that. Unlike the two cats from Kilkenny, that's not as funny, isn't it? It's not funny at all. And why isn't it funny? Because Christians are not supposed to behave like that. Believers are supposed to be people of love and peace, but too often we aren't. So Jesus knew that this was going to happen, so he gave us some explicit instructions. So I invite you to find Luke chapter 6 in your Bible. It's on page 595. In the Pew Bible ahead of you, Luke 6, we're going to read verses 27 through 36 to start. So would you stand as we read God's word today? Luke 6, 27 through 36. But I say to you who hear, love your enemies, do good to those who hate you, bless those who curse you, pray for those who abuse you. To the one who strikes you on the cheek, offer the other one also. And from one who takes away your cloak, do not withhold your tunic either. Give to everyone who begs from you, and from one who takes away your goods, do not demand them back. And as you wish that others would do to you, do so to them. If you love those who love you, what benefit is that to you? Even sinners love those who love them. And if you do good to those who do good to you, what benefit is that to you? For even sinners do the same. And if you lend to those from whom you expect to receive, what credit is that to you? Even sinners lend to sinners to get back the same amount. But love your enemies and do good and lend, expecting nothing in return, and your reward will be great, and you will be sons of the Most High." For he is kind to the ungrateful and the evil. Be merciful, even as your Father is merciful. Pray with me this morning. God, um, tough words, candidly. Words which uh, I confess aren't easy for me to hear because uh, it is very easy for me to not love those who I don't like. And yet, God, you call us to this. And so, Lord, I pray this morning you would just open our hearts to the truth of your word. God, I pray what I say this morning would be truth. It would be how this is supposed to be interpreted. God, I pray that you would convict and challenge us, God. I pray this morning that we would hear your word and act upon it. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. <clears throat> 
Notice how this passage starts in verse 27. It says, but I say to you who hear, I say to you who are going to consider or to understand or to perceive what I'm going to say, love your enemies, do good to those who hate you, bless those who curse you, and pray for those who abuse you. What Jesus is doing here is picking up on the theme from verse 22 that Pastor Kevin led us through last week, where it says, Blessed are you when people hate you, and when they exclude you, and revile you, and spurn your name as evil on account of the Son of Man. The Greek word here for love is the word agape. It's a kind of love that is deliberate. It's love that's rooted in the will. It's love that is a choice. It's love that doesn't depend on how other people treat you. It's love that you choose to do, not what you feel like doing. It's not passive. It's not avoidant. It's active and creative. Agape love chooses to do good things even to your enemies. And it's love that is expressed in actions. It's you basically saying, I love this person because of God's grace, I choose to love this person. It was addressed in the companion passage in Matthew chapter 5, verses 43 and 44, where it says, you have heard that it was said, you shall love your enemy and hate your neighbor, but I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. Notice the things that Jesus commands us to do. He commands us to love, which we talked about. He commands us to do good, which really means to speak well of even and to honor. He commands us to bless, to praise, to help cause, to prosper, even to help make happy. That's what he's commanding us to do. And he's commanding us to pray for our enemies. I I wonder how much of that comes natural for us? I I don't think much at all. The Associated Press ran a story in 1994 about a gal named Cindy Hartman. She was out in her yard and she walked into her house to answer the phone and she was confronted by a burglar. He ripped the phone cord out of the wall and ordered her into a closet. Cindy dropped to her knees and asked the burglar if she could pray for him. I want you to know that God loves you and I forgive you. The burglar apologized for what he had done. Then he yelled out the door to a lady in the pickup and said, Stop! We've got to unload all that stuff. This is a Christian house. This woman is a Christian. We can't do this to them. And he took all the bullets out of his gun, handed her the gun, and left. Sometimes praying for your enemies is extremely powerful, isn't it? Jesus picks up just some examples here of how the disciples are to act to their enemies in the next four verses, or a few verses starting with verse 29. To one who strikes you on the cheek, offer the other also. And from one who takes away your cloak, do not withhold your tunic either. Give to everyone who begs from you, and from one who takes away your goods, do not demand them back. What the readers see in these verses are really persecution scenarios. They are hostile actions from people who hate Jesus' disciples. Now, Jesus here is not teaching a general across-the-board resistance as if he forbids self-defense. Jesus is not teaching that if there's a legitimate request from somebody who needs assistance, that we should ignore them. These instances depict what happens when disciples suffer, as we read in verse 22, on account of the Son of Man. So it's always interesting. How how will we respond? Do, Do we repay evil for evil? Mahatma Gandhi said it well. An eye for the an eye makes the whole world blind. And it's even just not a physical response here that Jesus is talking about. It's 
It's what kind of attitude do we have when people treat us poorly? Because, you know, it's easy to have a blank face and not show our emotions and be seething on the inside. What's your heart like? That's why Jesus gives us the following verse, verse 31, and as you wish what others would do to you, do also to them. Now, some of you think, hey, it's the golden rule. Well, it's more than that. Jesus is saying to deliberately treat others well, regardless of how they treat you. Garrison Keillor has a quote where he says, do unto others who don't like you as you would have them do to you, but no, they won't. Do this before they can do the devious deed to you and that they would do if given a chance. Shame them with goodness. Kill them with kindness. Cut their throats with courtesy. It's interesting, isn't it? Jesus goes on in verse 32, if you love those who love you, what benefit is that to you? For even sinners love those who love them. And if you do good to those who do good to you, what benefit is that to you? For even sinners do the same. And if you lend to those who, uh, from whom you expect to receive, what credit is to you? Even sinners lend to sinners to get back the same amount. Jesus tells us in these verses that loving those who love us is easy. Everybody can do that. There's no benefit for the one who loves his friends. Back in Matthew chapter 5, it says it this way, For if you love those who love you, what reward do you have? Do not even the tax collectors do the same. Jesus is essentially saying, I'm not calling you to what's conventional and normal. I'm calling you to exceptional behavior. What's so great about treating someone well who's treated you well? Every person does that, and there's nothing different, nothing distinctive about that. But blessing those who curse you, praying for those who abuse you, that's not more of the same old thing. That's surprising and uncommon. He continues in verse 35 where it says, But love your enemies and do good and lend, expecting nothing in return, and your reward will be great, and you will be sons of the Most High, for he is kind to the ungrateful and the evil. Be merciful even as the Father is merciful. Back in verse 23, he talks about a reward. He said, Blessed, rejoice in that day and leap for joy, for behold, your reward is great in heaven. Proverbs 25, verses 21 through 22, says it again this way. If your enemy is hungry, give him bread to eat, and if he is thirsty, give him water to drink, for you will heap burning coals on his head, and the Lord will reward you. How often do we think about killing our enemies with kindness? We, we just want to kill them sometimes. There was a family who had been doing morning devotions together and had read the passage about loving your enemies and feeding your enemies. And the two boys in the family who were seven and ten years old at the time were especially puzzled. Why, why should we love and feed our enemies? Their parents wondered too, but the only answer that dad could give them was, well, we should because God said so. A few days later, they learned why God said so. It seemed that the older boy, who was in fifth grade by the name of John, would come home from school complaining about a classmate who sat behind him. He told his mom and dad, Bob keeps jabbing me when Miss Smith isn't looking. One of these days when I'm on the playground, I'm going to jab Bob back. Well, nothing happened. Day after day, kept going on until finally the mother was ready to go down to the school and jab Bob herself. And the youngest boy, the seven-year-old, 
looked up at his mom and said, maybe we should feed him. Well, well, that kind of startled the whole family. I mean, none of them were really sure about this enemy business, and when you're 7 and 10, you, you don't think of an enemy as someone being in your class. You think of someone who maybe lives across the world. Well, everyone looked to Dad, since he was the head of the family, and Dad kind of shrugged his shoulders and said, well, I guess we could do that because God said so. So the mother turned to John and said, what does Bob like to eat? If we're going to feed him, we're going to feed him something he likes to eat. John said, jelly beans. Bob just loves jelly beans. So they bought a bag of jelly beans for John to take to school, and they decided that the next time Bob jabbed John, John would just turn around, wouldn't say anything, and put the jelly beans on his desk. The next afternoon, the boys rushed home from the bus with John yelling, it worked, Mom, it worked. Mom said, what did Bob do? What did he say? Well, he didn't do anything. I just turned around. He was so surprised. He took the jelly beans, and he didn't jab me the rest of the day. The mom goes on to say that in time, John and Bob became best friends, all because of a bag of jelly beans. And in fact, not only did they become best friends, but both boys grew up and became missionaries on a foreign field. And their way of showing friendship with their enemies was often to invite people to their house around food. The mom noted, it seems that enemies are always hungry. Maybe that's why God says to feed them. What a great example of loving your enemies. Be merciful as your father is merciful. I I think in the footnote it says, give them jelly beans. Jesus goes on in this passage, starting with verse 37, where he says, Judge not, and you will not be judged. Condemn not, and you will not be condemned. Forgive, and you will be forgiven. Give, and it will be given to you. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together, running over, will be put in your lap. For with the measure you use it, it will be measured back to you. And he told them a parable. Can a blind man lead a blind man? Will they not both fall into a pit? A disciple is not above his teacher, but everyone, when he is fully trained, will be like his teacher. Why do you see that speck in your brother's eye, but do not notice the log that is in your own eye? How can you say to your brother, brother, let me take the speck out of your own eye, when you yourself do not see the log that is in your own eye? You hypocrite. First, take the log out of your own eye, and then you will see clearly to take the speck that is in your brother's eye. For no good fruit, no good tree bears bad fruit, nor again does a bad tree bear good fruit. For each tree is known by its fruit. For figs are not gathered from thorn bushes, nor are grapes picked from a bramble bush. The good person out of the treasure, out of the good treasure of his heart produces good, and the evil person out of his evil treasure produces evil. For out of the abundance of his heart, his mouth speaks. Jesus calls us in these verses to discernment. And he does it by two negative defining charges here. Don't judge, and you won't be judged. Don't condemn, and you won't be condemned. You know, there are a lot of people who think Jesus is saying something here that he's not. In fact, these might be some of the most misunderstood verses in the Bible. People who don't know a single Bible verse or maybe don't even know that there's an Old Testament and a New Testament can come to these verses when they feel the slightest bit of disapproval. Americans love these verses because judging someone is thought to be one of the most heinous of crimes today. Never mind that they're lifting these verses out of context and ignoring scripture that calls for Christians 
to judge and at even times condemn sin. We just kind of read that when Jesus talked in verses 43 through 45 about a tree bearing fruit. I mean, we make a judgment on people by the fruit that they bear. Unfortunately, we tend to make judgments based on what we see. A lot of times by appearance. John 7.24 says, Do not judge by appearances, but judge with right judgment. We make, we make judgments every day, don't we? We have standards of morality and we make decisions repeatedly about what we accept and what we don't accept. We decide what's right and wrong and, and we're commanded to do that because as believers, we need to know what we should and shouldn't be doing. We need to discern. Romans 12, 2 says, Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that by testing you may discern what the will of God is, what is good and acceptable and perfect. What Jesus is disallowing here is a judgmental, condemning attitude. It's one thing to stand against evil, and we should, but it's quite another thing to despise people who do those things. To think of ourselves as better, to despise people who dress a certain way, to despise people who come from a different culture, who live a certain way, who have a different skin color. It's judging for the pleasure of judging. That's why Jesus tells us that judgmental people will be judged and condemning people will be condemned. And then Jesus says to forgive and you will be forgiven. It's an absolute statement. If you want to be forgiven, forgive. It's part of how Jesus taught in the Lord's Prayer. For, forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. In fact, just after that passage in Matthew chapter 6 are these verses, Matthew 6, 14, and 15, but if you forgive others' trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. And if you do not forgive others their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. And not only forgive, but give. So don't judge, don't condemn, do forgive, do give, but, but give to who? Well, in the context of this passage, it's give to people you don't like. But you say, I don't want to give to people I don't like. I don't want to give things to enemies that I don't like. I don't want to share things with enemies. Why waste good stuff on bad people? Remember what Jesus said in verse 35, do good and lend, expect nothing in return, and your reward will be great. He's reemphasizing that in this verse. And he's telling us that the measure to which we give will be given back to us. Jesus goes into a parable in verses 39 and 40. I think what he's telling us here is to pay close attention to who you listen to. Have discernment. If you choose a misguided teacher, you'll be led astray. In one of the commentaries I read, it was also taken as a warning to Jesus' disciples not to take lightly the task of leading and teaching others. And what's the objective? To stay out of the pit and to be fully equipped. Jesus continues on pressing home the need for self-critique and assessment in verses 41 and 42. Why do you see the tiny speck in your eye and do not see the telephone pole, or rather, the tiny speck in your brother's eye, and don't see the telephone pole in your eyes. Isn't it amazing how often we are blind to our own sin? Isn't it, isn't it I, I'm convicting, I guess it should be, that, that it's easy for us to notice the sin in other people that oftentimes is the very sin that we struggle with. We fixate on 
just the most minute things in other people sometimes, don't we? And we ignore the major faults that we have. You know, the problem here is is not seeing the weakness or sins of others. The problem is seeing others' minor faults while not addressing the massive faults in our life. Jesus is not saying we must never help a fellow disciple handle sin in their life. Helping people remove specks is not wrong. Galatians 6.1 says, Brothers, if anyone is caught in transgression, you who are spiritual should restore him in a spirit of gentleness. But notice the next sentence. Keep watch on yourself, lest you too be tempted. One of the commentaries I read had this sentence. No splinter detection without beam elimination first. It's a good one to remember, isn't it? No splinter detection without beam elimination first. Jesus goes on in verses 43 through 45 to talk about bad fruit. And he introduces it kind of with that little word for that tells us that he's expanding on the verses previous. And the the chain of thought is something like the hypocrite produces bad fruit. It's kind of a short lesson on botany right here. There's always a corresponding consistency in these matters. You don't find thorn plants producing figs or grapes coming from brambles. What is visibly produced is tied to the plant. Jesus then moves from trees and plants to people. What they produce is tied to their internal condition. For what our heart is, is really what we are. The primary intent here is self-examination, not examination of others. Jesus is calling you to take a minute and look at yourself. He's asking you to assess your own fruit and even ask yourself about the condition of your heart. Jesus finishes this passage with the following verses, starting in verse 46. And why do you call me Lord, Lord, and not do what I tell you? Everyone who comes to me and hears my words and does them, I will show you what he is like. He is like a man building a house who dug deep and laid the foundation on the rock. And when a flood arose, the stream broke against the house and could not shake it because it had been well built. But the one who hears and does not do them is like a man who built a house on the ground without a foundation. When the stream broke against it, immediately it fell, and the ruin of that house was great. Jesus begins these last few verses with a rebuke. Why why do you call me Lord and don't do what I say? Jesus is after more than just empty profession here. Do, Do our actions match our words? So he sets up a couple of alternatives before his hearers. He speaks of of two builders. And the first one exemplifies what Jesus wants. And I like how he sets it up with some verbs in verse 47. He says, everyone who comes to me and hears my words and does them, I will show you what he is like. You see the progression? Comes, hears, does. The right response to Jesus puts his teaching into practice. Let me say that again. The right response to Jesus puts his teaching into practice. And that response is like a house builder who digs and goes deeper and sets a foundation upon a rock. And the floods come and slam against it, and the house can't shake because it's too well built. And on the other hand, you have the person who I think is maybe fascinated with Jesus, but doesn't submit to him. 
He's in a hurry to get something done and is satisfied to build on top of what at the moment might look like hard ground, but is not a sure foundation. I read a few years ago about a brand new housing subdivision in Nevada. It was, it was beautiful, brand new, everything was good, but there was a problem. Several months after many of the families had moved in, serious cracks began to develop in the driveways and on the roads. There was a constant disturbing smell of methane gas coming up from the ground. What was wrong? Well, it seemed that the builders of this subdivision had built their houses directly on top of a landfill. The landfill was 20 feet below the living rooms of these houses, and things got so bad that the floors shook and the walls began to crack, and houses began to sink into the ground. Obviously, someone forgot the importance of a good foundation. So what's your foundation this morning? I mean, you know, God knows. Are you built on a good foundation? You may have noticed uh, the title of the sermon this morning. You want me to do what? I think for a lot of us, when it comes to loving our enemies, and not being judgmental, that crosses our mind. Now, I don't like lutefisk or or beets. Some of you are thinking squirrel. My point is this. I, I struggle with it. I think there are times I would rather drop raw lutefisk and beets in a blender and hit puri and then chug that rather than love my enemies. It's not easy, is it? But it's what God calls us to do. And I go back to verse 47, where where it says those three verbs, everyone who comes to me, who hears my words and does them, and does them. Family, you you know how you're living. You, You know what kind of foundation you have under you today. God calls us to love and not to be judgmental. I think most everyone here has heard of Corey Ten Boom. Corey and her family helped hide Jews from the Nazis during the Holocaust in Germany, and eventually Corey and her family were caught, and they were sent to a concentration camp, and Corey and her sister Betsy ended up in the same camp, which was good because they were especially close. Eventually, Betsy died in that camp. In any event, the the war ended, and Corey became famous for what she had lived through and was often asked to talk about that in churches. So she would talk about God's love and forgiveness. And one night, she's at a church, a big church in Munich, and she's shocked to see one of the former SS guards who had stood at the shower room at the concentration camp. He was a cruel man who had mocked Corey and Betsy and all the other prisoners He was actually the first of the jailers that Corey had seen since the war ended. And Corey writes, suddenly it all came back. Men mocking us in heaps of clothing and Betsy's pain-blanched face when she died. 
As the church was emptying at the end of the service, this man came up to Corey, beaming and bowing, and said, how, how grateful I am for your message to think, as you say, that Jesus has washed away my sins. Corey continues that as he said that, he, he thrust his hand out to me. And I, who had preached so often to people about the need to forgive, kept my hand at my side. Even as those angry, vengeful thoughts boiled through me, I saw the sin in them. Jesus had died for this man. Was I going to ask for more? So Corey prayed, forgive me, and helped me to forgive him. She goes, I tried to smile. I, I tried to raise my hand, but I couldn't. I, I felt nothing, not even the slightest spark of warmth or charity. So again, I, I breathed a prayer, but it was different. Jesus, I can't forgive him. Give me your forgiveness. And her hand came up. And as I shook his hand, the most incredible thing happened. Corey writes, from, from my shoulder, along my arm, and down through my hand, there was this current that seemed to pass from me to him. And into my heart sprang a love for this man that almost overwhelmed me. God calls us to love our enemies, and when he calls us to do that, he gives us along with the command to love itself. Join me as we pray. God, we, we can't... We can't live the life you want without you. With, without you giving us strength, without you helping us along the way. God, you, you modeled this. You modeled love for your enemies because we, in a sense, became enemies of you when sin entered the world. And your love for us was so great that you sent your son to give us the forgiveness of sins, to give us salvation, to give us hope for eternity. And so, Lord, you ask us as believers just to model that to others. And so, Lord, would you, would you just help us to do that? God, would, would you help us to hear? This, this passage started with, to those that hear. And it ends toward the end with, with hear. So God, help us to hear when your spirit leads us. Help us to hear when you bring people into our path that need to know your love. Help us to hear when you direct us, God, to love our enemies, to do something to be generous with, with what you've given us. Help us to hear, and then, God, help us to do. Help us to be obedient to what you want us to do. In Jesus' name, amen.